Um, today, uh, I'm actually going to talk about the gift of tongues. And part of the reason is we, we get a common question, you know, is speaking in tongues the sign for the baptism in the Spirit? And if you've been here and paying attention, you've probably figured out by now the answer to that question um, that we believe theologically um, is the answer. But uh, also there's lots of questions around, around tongues and the, some of the gifts of the Spirit. And so some of this is just to answer some questions and, and to give you um, basically, hey, where does the church leadership stand on some of these theological questions? But I'm so grateful to the Lord because I feel like he gave us a living example this morning of the importance, really, and the gift of tongues. I don't know about you, but after we started singing in tongues, the Lord told somebody here, like, hey, I think we're supposed to sing in tongues. So I just announced it. I felt that way, too. Um, but there was a shift in the atmosphere. There was a shift. There was a shift in my heart. I felt a shift, a fresh freedom, and a wave of worship and faith came into the room. And uh, that's what tongues does. It actually bypasses our natural mind. And our natural mind can be a blessing, and man, it can be a curse. Because when our mind lies to us, it's a curse. And uh, tongues... That gift of tongues bypasses our natural mind, which can often be an enemy to us. And even things that we think we understand, good is the enemy of the best. We might understand and know good things, but God might be trying to give us the best, but we won't grab onto the best because we won't let go of the good things. Um, so we saw an example of it this morning, and I just thought that was awesome. So I want to jump in here. Um, Acts 2-3, we know this is the very famous uh, scripture on tongues, that at Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit fell, and it says, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you were not here two weeks ago, I want to highly encourage you to get the message. Um, I talked about the baptism of the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and being full of the Spirit. And they're all different things. I think it's important, even if you don't agree with me, that's okay. Um, I don't always agree with myself either. Uh, <laughs> I think it's important that you know kind of where we stand, and it'll, I think, help you be a little bit more biblically mature. But here, the, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, and tongues of fire rested on their heads, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2.11, a couple verses later, says, Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We, had, uh, we were discipled by a prophet in Austria. He's an American guy, but he's a missionary in Austria. And he was telling me a story once. Um, I think, I can't remember if he was in the Czech Republic. He was preaching somewhere, and he speaks English and German. And he was preaching in German to this German-speaking church. And at the end of his sermon, maybe it was Poland, I don't remember, <laughs> This lady came up and just started speaking to him in this language that he didn't know, like super excited. Let's just say it's Polish. I don't remember which one it was. She's speaking in Polish to him, super excited and waiting for him to respond back. And he said in German, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you're saying. And she started getting agitated and saying more Polish and getting more and more angry. And he was asking for an interpreter. And an interpreter finally came. And uh, he said, what is she trying to say? And the lady said, why are you acting like you don't know what I'm saying? Like angry. And he said, ma'am, I don't speak Polish. I only speak German and English. And she said, 
I, why are you lying? And he said, I swear I don't. She said, I heard you for 45 minutes speaking Polish. You were preaching in Polish. And the people around her said, no, he wasn't. He was preaching in German. She literally heard him in her own tongue. And he said, read that, read that again. They spoke in other tongues. They heard in their own language. So were they speaking gibberish and everyone heard in their own language? Or were they speaking another language? Because it doesn't say language, it says uh, glossolalia, the word, Greek word for literally a tongue. Were they speaking in other languages and they heard in their own language? Or were, were they speaking in gibberish and they heard? Or were they speaking in real languages and they heard the real languages? We don't really know 100% for sure. It doesn't really matter. The point is that gift of interpretation of tongues, that lady was operating in that gift without even realizing it. She had no idea, but she heard someone speaking in another language, and she heard it in her own language. And it made me revisit that Acts chapter 2 and go, oh, wow, there's a possibility there that I never considered. Um, she actually heard in her own language. Now, I'll just remind you again, the early church fathers actually believed um, that tongues were real languages, and not all the early church fathers spoke in tongues, but they all believed that they were real languages. And there was no official church doctrine, um, no denomination that actually believed that the evidence of being baptized in the Spirit was speaking in tongues until 1900 through Charles Parham. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, or if you weren't, Charles Parham kind of created this doctrine, and William Seymour, his student, uh, believed him, had not received the gift, did not speak in tongues, but he moved to Azusa Street in L.A. and put a box over his head and said, well, no one can see the glory of God and live, so he put a box over his head so the glory of God could come so that he wouldn't see it and die. And they started praying and having a prayer meeting and a lady there started speaking in tongues. But it was not a language. It was like gibberish kind of sounding. You could tell it wasn't a language. You can tell when someone's speaking a language, right? Versus just kind of blabbering, right? Um, and tongues broke out. Hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people received the gift of tongues and a mighty outpouring of the Spirit. And that gave birth to the Pentecostal movement that spread all over the world and has been one of the most influential moves of God that the world has ever known. It's still being spread around the world. But, uh, interestingly enough, Charles Parham, the guy that said, hey, tongues are, are for now, and that's the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, he showed up at Azusa Street. And heard them speaking in gibberish, clearly not a real language. And he rebuked them and said, this isn't from God. Tongues are real languages. Was he right? I don't know. I don't think he was. Maybe he was. I don't know. But Acts chapter 2, that they heard in their own language, opens up the possibility that that's not necessarily the case. Whether Charles Parham was right or wrong, it was an incredible move of God, an incredible move of God. But we've come a long way doctrinally in the Pentecostal and charismatic churches just a little over 120 years ago. No one said, hey, tongues is evidence. They believed in the gift, but tongues is the evidence for baptism of the Spirit. To come up with that theology now today, we've moved a long way, and it's just been very recently. So, we want to look at this. You know, what is tongues? How do you get it? Does everybody get it? Uh, we'll just answer some of these questions. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, 
Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the mega charisma, the higher gifts, the bigger gifts. And he goes on to talk about love, right? Um, there's been some kind of debate or arguments, I guess, about do all work miracles? Some say, well, yeah. Some people, well, no. Well, literally in the Greek, where it says, are all apostles? First of all, we don't know that these are questions. There weren't question marks in the Greek. You would gauge if it's a question by the sentence structure. So it could be a question, might not be. But literally in the Greek, there's three words. No, and the word to be, no, and the word all, and then the word apostle. And then no, all prophets, no, all teachers. So it could say, no, not everyone is an apostle. No, not everyone is a prophet. No, not everyone is a teacher. Whether it's a question or not doesn't matter. The Greek sentence structure of this does not leave any room whatsoever for the answer to be yes. It doesn't leave that room. It says, no, not everyone speaks in tongues. No, not everyone interprets tongues. No, not everyone is a teacher. No, not everyone is a prophet. Um, so some people, some theologians, Pentecostal especially, have said, well, yeah, it does say no, but they're talking about the public use versus the private use. So the public use of tongues, speaking a tongue in a meeting versus just speaking in tongues in your own prayer closet or in your own personal life. But that doesn't actually make sense either because there isn't a private use of apostling or a private use of prophesying or a private use of teaching, right? You don't teach yourself. You don't prophesy to yourself. You don't apostle yourself. Those are all public ministries for the benefit of another person. So correct biblical interpretation would tell us here, okay, not everyone speaks in tongues. Not everyone is an apostle. Um, <clears throat> First Corinthians 12, 4 says this, and we kind of talked about this a couple weeks ago. Now, there are varieties of gifts, charisma, but the same spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. He empowers the gifts or the service or the activities. All three, right? So we have gifts, services, and activities. It's the same God, the same Holy Spirit that's empowering them all in everyone. To each, to each one, to each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The Spirit is the Lord. Scripture says, right? The Spirit is the Lord. So you could actually say to each is given a manifestation of God. When we exercise a spiritual gift or a spiritual service or a spiritual activity, we are manifesting God outwardly to the world for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. And this is what the next verse says. Who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Well, if everyone gets the gift of tongues, it wouldn't say he apportions to each one as he decides, as he wills. It would say, well, everyone gets this one, but not everyone gets these other ones. Right? We have to leave open the possibility that it's the will of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And we talked about this some weeks ago as well. Is this a permanent gift that we get to have for the rest of our life? 
an exercise for the rest of our life? Or could this be that when we come into a public meeting, every one of us that have the Spirit, who is the giver of every gift, we all potentially have every gift within us, and as the Spirit wills and as the Spirit moves us and leads us, every one of us could potentially exercise every one of these gifts when the Spirit wills. That was probably more the view of the early church fathers. And I would argue maybe more what the Apostle Paul was thinking. When you each come together, right, the manifestation of the Spirit as He leads. So maybe one day one person has a tongue and someone else has the interpretation, and it's different the next time that there's a gathering of believers. But we need to leave open the option that this is something as the Lord wills, as He wants to give it. Um, if tongues is the evidence that you have the Spirit, then the Spirit cannot give the gift as He wills, right? Paul would just say something clearly different. He would say something clearly different. Hey, everyone gets this gift, but all these, it's only as the Lord wants you to have them when He wants you to have them, whoever He decides when and where, right? Um, many people say that there's a pattern in the book of Acts uh, of people being filled with the Spirit, and the result is speaking in tongues. There's actually about a dozen instances in the book of Acts where people, the Spirit comes on them, or they're filled with the Spirit, or baptized in the Spirit. There's about a dozen instances. There's only three mentions of the tongues. And one of them is Acts chapter 2. The other one is Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and the first Gentiles getting saved and receiving the gift of the Spirit. And then a third one is in Acts 19. Paul finds some guys. He says, hey, did you receive the Spirit? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Spirit. What were you baptized into? John's baptism. Like, they didn't even know that you could get baptized in Jesus' name. They didn't know about Jesus. They just knew about repenting and receiving God's forgiveness. So he led them to the Lord. They got baptized, and he prayed for them. And it says that they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. And they prophesied. So when King Saul had the Spirit of God come upon him, he prophesied. Uh, when God took some of the Spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70, what happened to them? They prophesied. So predominantly in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon somebody, the predominant gift was prophecy, not tongues. So we, we've kind of taken these three instances when there's a dozen in the book of Acts and turned it into a doctrine that um, I think does some damage. And I'll, I'll share why in a little bit. Um, but since there's an instance where Paul prayed and someone speaks in tongues and prophesies and there's all these Old Testament examples of people, the Spirit coming and prophesying. Why don't we make people prophesy? When they come up here, hey, we're going to pray for you to receive the Spirit. Now speak in tongues and prophesy. We don't say and prophesy. We, we push tongues. And I get why. It is important. It is a gift. I speak in tongues. Casey speaks in tongues. You know, most of us in this room probably speak in tongues. So I'm not uh, bad-mouthing tongues, just making it into a doctrine and pushing it on people, I think does some damage. So here's a question that I had to answer, uh, or to the best of my conclusion, and I'll give you the best of my conclusion. Why is tongues only New Testament? And in fact, specifically, why is it only post-Jesus' ascension? It's not even New Testament. It's New Testament only after Jesus ascended to the Father. We looked at several weeks ago that Zechariah was filled with the Spirit, that Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit, that Jesus was clearly filled with the Spirit, that there were some uh, older folks in the temple, Simon and, and this prophetess, they, the Spirit was on them and they prophesied and the Spirit was on them. Nobody spoke in tongues before Jesus ascended up into heaven and the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. Nobody spoke in tongues. It's possible Jesus spoke in tongues, but likely not. Likely not. If it was important that we knew that, the writers would tell us. Why didn't the disciples ever go, hey, that weird language thing? 
what are you doing? Can you teach us how to do it? They didn't ask that. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray, right? Jesus didn't say, well, say, bought a Honda, should have bought a Toyota three times fast. <laughs> no, he gave us the Lord's Prayer, right? He gave us the Lord's Prayer. So there's a, what is the reason? Why is tongues only given post Jesus' ascension? Have you, I don't know if you've ever thought about that question. Almost all the other gifts are present pre-Jesus, except for that one. What is the deal? Well, it's possible someone spoke in tongues before. I don't know. But I believe that there is no mention of it for a specific reason. And this is my opinion. is the best opinion, I, conclusion I can come up with. And I've never heard anyone come up with a better one. So for now, I'm sticking with it. And then you can find your own. Um, what is the one big story in the Old Testament about language? Tower of Babel. What happened in the Tower of Babel? Why were they gathered and what were they united around? What's that? Why were they building a tower? To ascend to God, to make a name for themselves, right? We will ascend to God and we will make a name for ourselves, right? So what, what was God's opinion about that? He didn't like that, right? What's the evidence that we know he didn't like that? Yeah, he said, no, this isn't good. If they're unified in their sin, this is a problem. So because they were unified in their sin, unified to make a name for themselves, what did God do? He confused their languages. And what did the confusion of language do? It stopped the spread of sin. It stopped their unity around sin. So, if all the other gifts are present pre-Jesus, except for that one, and then at Acts chapter 2, 120, we actually read a scripture about 120 blowing their trumpets, and the glory of God came in the dedication of the temple... If tongues came down, what could God be implying? Or what could God be trying to communicate? Or what could God, through the author Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, what could God, through Luke, be trying to communicate to the church and to the rest of the world? Unity around holiness. We know right now, right, God, globalism has been a rising movement in the last decades. And it's very clear that the world powers are trying to move us back to a one world government with a one world currency and a one world language and a one world religion. The, the UN parliament building is actually modeled after the Tower of Babel. Look it up. It's modeled after the Tower of Babel. All the nations coming together unified around one purpose, to lift themselves up, make a name for themselves. It's not good, right? So after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, when his spirit was given to permanently dwell in man, we are now a people not united around sin, but united around holiness. We are sent out to set the world free from sin, not to spread our sin. We aren't united around pride to make a name for ourselves. We're united around humility and love and to make a name for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. It's my opinion that God, through Luke, is pointing out that when we bow the, name, or the knee to Jesus, the curse is reversed and tongues or languages given to the church is God's endorsement that we are the only truly authorized earthly government that is fully endorsed by heaven. He says, this I approve of. This I approve of. These are my citizens. We have now become citizens of heaven. We are now ambassadors of Jesus Christ. It is his endorsement. He didn't make all the world one language. 
because there's still people sinning. He still needs to stop the spread of sin amongst the world, right? But the internet sure is bringing that together. One language in English and the internet, right, is spreading sin like crazy. It's also spreading righteousness like crazy. I personally believe that's why this, this one gift was reserved till then, till Acts chapter 2, to say, these are my heavenly endorsed people. Anyone who is submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ can be trusted. They can be trusted to, to rule and to reign. Not to lord it over as the Gentiles do, as Jesus said, but to come and serve in love and bring righteousness and repentance and stop the spread of sin and, and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I personally believe it was set aside, or at least not mentioned until now. It's God's endorsement of a body of people united around holiness and united around Jesus. If you can think, come up with a better biblical answer, I would love to hear it. I really would, but that's the, the best I can come up with. It's amazing. I've been to 33 different countries. I'm getting ready to go to my 34th. All the language barriers, all the food barriers, all the culture barriers, all the differences. Whenever you meet another believer in Jesus Christ, no matter how radically different the culture is, there's a kinship. You feel at home with each other. It's the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing. You go to a very different culture. You can't speak a language, but you can feel a familial, we're one. You can feel the unity around Jesus Christ. It's amazing. We're, we truly are united through faith. We are baptized by one spirit into one body. It's amazing. 1 Corinthians 14.4 says this, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So the gift of tongues is for several different reasons, the Bible says. One is to build up our own faith. And that's what we saw demonstrated practically here this morning. It's like we don't know what to pray. Like we can think of good things, but the Spirit knows the best things. And so I'm just going to speak in tongues. And every time I speak in tongues like that, it doesn't matter the context, something of faith starts boiling bubbling up in me and, and something shifts in the atmosphere and then usually I'm switching to English and praying certain things and it's almost like it starts my spiritual engine. So Paul says here, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. It's for building ourselves up. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. I could read the rest, but even more to prophesy. What if Paul was here today, what would he say? I want you all to speak in tongues. I want you all to be able to speak in tongues. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So tongues is for edifying ourselves, but occasionally the Lord leads us to speak out a tongue out loud that it can be interpreted to bring a supernatural message to build up the people around us. And I've, I've seen this. We've seen it here. I'd like to see more of it. But if we're going to see more of it, that brings the opportunity for someone to get really zealous or attention or whatever. It, it brings an opportunity to operate in the flesh. This gift is the most easily abused gift. It's not that dangerous when it's abused, but it's the most easily abused. Prophecy is the most dangerous to be abused. Because you can really manipulate people's hearts with prophecy. Verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. How many of you that speak in tongues regularly pray that you have the interpretation? Probably not enough. I don't enough. I'll just be honest. I don't think about it. I just think, oh, this is for me. And I'm just praying in tongues. And I'm not praying, God, give me the gift of interpretation of tongues. Lord, what am I saying right now? What am I praying right now? 
The Apostle Paul said, if you speak in tongues, you should pray that you also can interpret. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And that's what we saw this morning, and I think that's one of the best reasons for this gift is it can bypass our carnal mind. Uh, verse 18, uh, four verses later, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So Apostle Paul spoke in tongues a lot. This isn't a gift to be ashamed of. This isn't a gift to be scared of. He spoke in tongues. He thought more than anybody else that he was addressing and the Corinthians were abusing this gift like crazy. So they were obviously doing it a lot. Um, Paul prayed in tongues a lot. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, if we, how many people here speak Swahili? Nobody? Okay. So if I had someone come up here from Swahili or Swaziland and spoke Swahili for half an hour, and there was no interpreter, how many of us would just be like, yes, that's awesome. You'd be like, what is he saying? I don't, what's the point? There's no point. That's the thing. If I'm going to stand up here and just speak in tongues for 10 minutes, and then there's no interpretation, and you have no idea what I said, and I have no idea what I said, what's the point of that? There is no point. Now, does that mean it's wrong to sing in tongues? Oh, I can sing in tongues. Can we pray in tongues and other people hear us? Yeah, unless you're being super annoying and obnoxious with it. That's not wrong. You're expressing your, your, your spirit and your worship and, and you're praying to God and you're building yourself up in your faith. Paul is saying, hey, don't be given 20-minute sermons in tongues with no interpretation. That's dumb. Nobody gets built up. The whole point of gifts is to edify each other, to build each other up. But he spoke in tongues a lot. Verse 26, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three at most, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. This is my hope for every place that you gather with another believer, whether it's a home group or with your family or with friends, or at a coffee shop, or here on Sunday morning, that we're not coming empty. Sometimes that happens, and we do come empty. We have hard weeks sometimes, and bad things happen to us. But we actually should be coming full, right? Full of God, having spent time with Him, bringing something, a manifestation of God to bless somebody else. We should have that goal in every gathering of believers that we have, no matter how big, no matter how small. The bigger the group, the harder it is to do that, um, but uh, home groups are a perfect environment for that. Verse 39, a couple verses later, so my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. When Casey was filled with the Spirit, she spoke in tongues right away. It just like came out it, she heard it, it bubbled up, it came out of her lips, she started speaking in tongues, some other people around her were speaking in, in tongues, and she actually understood what the other people around her were saying. She got the gift of tongues, and at that moment, she had the interpretation of the other tongues in, of the people that were around her. Um, it happened for her. Um, I know lots of people who get prayed for, and it just, it literally like busts out of their mouth, and they couldn't control it, and it just came out, you know, like throwing up. It just wah, came out. Um, I know some people who got prayed for and, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit and for the gift of tongues, and nothing happened. And then that night, they woke up in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. Or three days later, they're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, they speak in tongues. That happens. Um, I know uh, people who, who, this young man, actually Casey had to remind me of this story in Bosnia. We had a young Catholic guy, very nominally Catholic, showed up to church, you know, once, twice a year, never read his Bible once in his whole entire life, but he spoke English really well. And he came into one of our meetings. We had a house church in Bosnia. We met on Monday nights and some other nights, but 
we would just praise and worship and gifts of the Spirit, like prophetic words were coming and words of knowledge and healing and deliverance and all this stuff. And um, this guy went home and he prayed and he said, God, whatever they have, I want what they have. There's something different about them. They have something. I, I want that. And uh, he came back to us the next day and he said, I was, I was praying and asking the Lord and I started speaking in this weird noises and sounds in this, like this language. Is that normal? And Casey's like, yeah, you spoke in tongues. That's in the Bible. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. Like no one was there. No one prayed for him. He just asked the Lord, I want what they have. And he got the gift of tongues. Um, amazing. So what happens? Um, when, I was, when I received the Holy Spirit, I had a massive encounter with the Holy Spirit. It's like so big. It was in the book, There Is More by Randy Clark, a book on impartation. Me and Casey's story are in there, but I had such a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. I received power. I mean, it rocked me to the core. You know what I didn't get? I didn't get tongues. I didn't speak in tongues. I wanted to speak in tongues. I like tried to speak in tongues. I was open to speaking in tongues, I think. It just didn't happen. And I obviously had lots of fruit, power and miracles and words of knowledge and prophecy and like every, I mean, there was genuine night and day fruit that I had the Spirit of God on me. And I was empowered. Night and day difference. But I didn't get tongues. And what it actually, over time, it kind of made me think like, wow, am I in unbelief regarding this? Am I hard-hearted about this? I, I kind of felt like something was wrong with me because all these other people I knew spoke in tongues and I didn't. And uh, so I just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna just do it. And if it's babbling, fine, but it's better than nothing. You know, I'm just struggling in my mind about this thing, so I'm just gonna do it. I'm just going to babble and whatever comes out and trust the Lord's going to anoint it and something. So I actually did it and it was uncomfortable and weird and but I just kept doing it and I got really comfortable with these kind of several words and this babbling that I would do. I got comfortable with it. I got more comfortable with it. And but I actually had no idea like is this real? It didn't feel real. It didn't feel like a real gift of tongues. I didn't feel a real big difference. Strangely now, like a decade more later, I do feel something shifts when I speak in tongues. But to me, it still sounds like babbling. You know, maybe one day I'll figure out it's some language. I have no idea. Um, but, you know, it was babbling. I, I have seen a genuine, I don't want to say genuine, I have seen genuine languages with the gift of tongues. Like someone speaking in a real language, and you can tell. I mean, you can tell. There's this friend of ours in Southern California um, that she speaks in languages, and it's not just one all the time. Every time she opens her mouth, it's a different language. I mean, it's the weirdest thing. She even speaks in tongues in English, and she sounds like she's got a stuttering problem. And she'll even tell you, I'm just praying, and it comes out, and, and the words are out before her mind even knows what her tongue said. And she, she like, stutters in English. It's a trip. But this lady, um, I don't know, did you tell that story recently in, in here? Okay. You told it to somebody. Um, she, uh, they were in a prayer meeting. Casey was there uh, with a bunch of ladies. And this one family had just adopted a blind Chinese girl. She was a baby, like toddler. Blind Chinese girl. And can you imagine being a blind Chinese girl and you get picked up, you can't see anything, and some people are speaking some things you've never heard before, and then you go into a culture, and everyone around you is speaking unfamiliar stuff. And your world is dark, and everything is unfamiliar. I mean, how unsettling that would be. And this girl, once they brought her from China, this, this baby girl would not stop 
crying. She cried 24 hours a day, every waking moment, pretty much. And you had to hold her and rock her and just everything you could do to just try and get a moment of her not crying. And they're in this prayer meeting, and, and they're going for it. And all of a sudden, our friend starts speaking in tongues. And the little girl, the Chinese girl, had her head like this. eyes, You know, her eyes didn't work. And she turned her head and stopped crying and was listening. And everyone in the room was like, oh. She was singing. I'm sorry. She was singing. She was singing, and it sounded Chinese. But no one in the room spoke Chinese. So they didn't know, but they knew this little girl stopped crying, and she cocked her head towards the noise, and you can tell she's listening intently. So this, our friend just kept singing this thing, right, singing and singing and singing, and this girl was completely calm and listening the whole time. Weeks later, a couple weeks later, they actually went down to Lakeland during the Lakeland Revival, and this lady went into the women's bathroom, and there were some Chinese ladies there. And she said, hey, can I sing something to you? And can you tell me if it means anything? And they're like, okay. And she sang this thing, because she had sang it over and over and over, right? So she remembered. She sang this thing, and she said, does that mean anything to you? And the Chinese lady said, that's a very famous Chinese nursery rhyme. Whoa. Now that is a gift of tongues. That is incredible. That is incredible. So I've, I've seen it both ways. But one of the things that actually made me feel better, I was flipping through the TV channels one day, and this on the BBC channel, they were doing a documentary on the gift of tongues. And they were literally doing CAT scans or brain scans of people's brains while they're speaking in tongues. And so they had people, all these people they were interviewing, and they had them speaking in tongues, and a lot of them was just, sounded like blabbing, right? Sounded like my tongues, like gibberish, you know? But there were other ones that spoke, and you're like, man, that's a language. I don't know what language it is, but that's a language. It's got the natural pauses, and they're not taking weird, awkward breaths. Like, you can tell it's a language. And so they're studying this, and I'm watching this, and they're putting these people that are speaking in the real, sounds like languages, in the brain scan and showing what part of the brain was lighting up. And it was not the language center of the brain. When you speak in tongues, the language center of your brain is not lit up. It's a completely different part of your brain. And then they put the people in the machine that sounded like gibberish and blab blabbering, you know, and they even said, yeah, I just started blabbering. Um, and they got in the CAT scan machine, and guess what? It wasn't the language center of their brain either. It was the same exact part of the brain that lit up with the people that you could tell that's a real language. That's a real gift. It came spontaneously to them. And the other people that were blabbing kind of was like me. I just wanted to do it, and I just did it, right? And that made me feel better. I go, okay, well, there's something going on, right? At least I can confirm it's the same part of the brain as these people with the, the real gift or the real languages, you know? So I'm like, okay, I'm cool. I'm good. And I just kept going on with my life. Um, you know, it, it made me feel a lot better. But here's, I just want to mention a couple of the downsides. And one of the reasons that I'm sharing this, I think there's a couple downsides to having a doctrine that the evidence of receiving the Spirit is you must speak in tongues. Um, one, I think if you don't speak in tongues, that you feel like a second-class Christian. I kind of did. I wasn't really given permission that you don't have to. It was like everyone around me was like, yeah, you're filled with the Spirit. You speak in tongues. You know, reading some of the some of the stuff from uh, John G. Lake, you know, he would say, if you didn't have tongues, you don't want it bad enough. You're not holy enough. You need to keep fasting and praying. Maybe that was true. I don't know. But you get kind of taught that you're not hungry enough or you're not holy enough uh, or you're kind of a second-class Christian. That can happen. Um, it also causes people to fake it. I know lots of people that went to Pentecostal meetings and they got surrounded for like 15, 20 minutes. 
And people are like, speak in tongues, just open your mouth. And they're like, nothing happened. And they realize, I'm never getting out of here <laughs> until something happens. So they just started making it up. And yeah, everyone clapped and cheered and yay. And they went home knowing they made it up just to get out of that awkward situation. And unfortunately, uh, it creates that. Um, some people were just, you're instructed, say, you know, bought a Honda, should have bought a Toyota three times fast, and just keep saying it until something happens. Um, and unfortunately, when we do that, we can maybe start babbling like I did, but we don't actually pursue the real gift. We don't actually fast and pray and say, Lord, if you have this for me, if you want this for me, give it to me. Use me in this gift. I want to, even if you don't speak in tongues on a regular basis, if you have the spirit, you have the gift giver, it's possible. So you could come to church next Sunday and say, Lord, I may not be able to speak in tongues, but it's possible. Use me. Use me, Lord. If he does, great. If he doesn't, you've got to submit to the Holy Spirit. It's as he wills, not as you will, right? Um, set, fourthly, we're not letting the Spirit empower as he wills. It's us taking charge of it. Now, one of the downsides of not kind of pushing this issue is that we can just kind of say, well, it didn't just erupt out of my mouth like a volcano, so I don't have it. And we just kind of stop there. And we just leave it at that. At least the Pentecostals, they have faith for something, right? They're like, let's go for this. Let's get this. Let's have faith for it. We should have faith for it. We should go after it. We should eagerly desire to be air-powered, as we learned a couple weeks ago, right? To be wind-powered, spirit-powered. We should eagerly desire that. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. No one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. And we read that tongues build yourself up. So one of the questions we have is, okay, well, if I don't speak in tongues, can God still hear my groans? Because we're taught that when you speak in tongues, it's the Holy Spirit interceding on your behalf. And yeah, I think that's, that's true, partially true. Could be your own spirit interceding on your behalf, bypassing your mind. Um, but can you still pray in the spirit? Yes, you can. Um, I didn't have time to write down these scriptures, but there's a bunch of scriptures. I encourage you to look them up. That God hears our groanings, literally our, ugh. He hears that as a prayer. He heard that in Egypt. He came to their rescue because they were crying out. I don't think they were all praying. They didn't know the God of Abraham. They just knew our great-great-grandfather had this God that he served that's not the same as these other ones, you know? I don't think they all had personal relationships with the Lord. They were just like, ah, oh, this slavery sucks, right? And God said, I hear you. I hear you. So there's lots of scriptures that he actually hears our, our grunting and our groaning and our, oh, our, God, ugh, when we don't have the language, ugh, that works. It gets to God. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. That means moaning or sighing. Doesn't mean tongues. Doesn't mean tongues. It means moaning, uh, sighing. It means that. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit, whether you speak in tongues or not, is interceding on your behalf. All right, so this is what I want to do.